Welcome to Tea with Erping. Around the time of Roman Empire, China was named by a unique yarn that has caused a sensation in the Occident. Because of this unique yarn, China was given the name the Empire of Silk. Where does silk come from? Legend has that the goddess Lei Zhu, wife of the Yellow Emperor, discovered the fiber from the silk cocoons and made them into silk. Around 4000 to 3000 BC, the luxurious silk seemed before its time. Hence, the silk, among many other things, such as the zither and the reed pipe, is perceived to be given by the gods. The story of silk has a legendary place in history. In 53 BC, while warring with the Parthian Empire, startled by the bright banners of the enemy, the Roman soldiers fled in panic. The banners were nothing more than the silk from China. By the 1st century AD, Romans became infatuated with silk, and excessive amounts of Roman money were squandered on it. The edict was issued to suppress the craze, yet the craze continued. Fifty-some years later, in the 6th century AD, the Byzantine Empire sent two monks to Asia, and they came back with silkworm eggs hidden inside their bamboo walking sticks. Since then, Silkworm cultivation began in Europe. Actually, a more precise name for Silk Road is Silk Roots, for the Silk Road is not any definite road in its modern sense of the word, but a network of trade routes that from people to camels to wild beasts traversed through the Silk Roots the Empire of Silk connected itself with Central Asia and Europe, reaching all the way to Rome. These trade routes ran from 2nd to 15th century AD, bridging some 4,000 miles of treacherous deserts and uninhabitable plains for over 1,000 years. The ancient Silk Road connected the two most powerful civilizations of the world, the Chinese Empire in the east and the Roman Empire in the west. And in between, there was a great Indian Empire. Going further west lies the great Mesopotamian plain, home to the Babylonian Empire. Next to it lies the ancient Egypt, across the vast silk roads. Indeed, the world's four ancient civilizations stood side by side on this Eurasian continent, ready for dazzling exchanges of exotic goods and brilliant ideas. Over the centuries, these legendary silk roads have become the bedrock not just for trading goods, perhaps more importantly, also for exchanging cultural norms. Where does the Silk Road originate? It dates back to the Han Dynasty around 130 BC, when the Han Emperor Wu Di sent General Zhang Qian as his envoy to Central Asia to seek strategic alliance. Gradually, the route evolved into a network of trade routes, reaching all the way to the other side of the Eurasian continent. Traveling to the west would have to go through the vast Gobi Desert, which hosts many ruins of the past kingdoms, such as Lowlan and Gautang ruins near Turpan. Thousand years ago, gold beard merchants and envoys from Roman emperors rode on sturdy camels through these dangerous routes. Some of them never returned. The exotic merchandise they sought were worth the hazardous trip. Silk, spices, porcelain, tea, grapes, melon, papers, gold, and glass vessels. Something else were also exchanged. Vibrant arts, styles, music, religions, languages, literature, philosophies. Namely, diverse cultures too were transported along these great routes. The Silk Road was like a crown dotted with the jewels of ancient cultures. Among the many religions, Buddhism shone like a star on these ancient roots. The caves of Buddhist statues and frescoes stood with splendid artistic achievements. Traveling along the Silk Road, great grottoes present themselves one after another. These marvels bear imprints of the power of human faith. Mount Sumeru grottoes in Ningxia province, Mai Jishan grottoes in Gansu province, Dunhuang frescoes in Gobi Desert, Kizo Southern Buddha Caves in Xinjiang, Bizaklik Southern Buddha Caves in Xinjiang, and the Great Buddha of Bamiyan in Central Afghanistan. 
Buddhism flourished in Central Asia for centuries, and Bamiyan was once a vibrant center of Buddhism, transmitting Buddhist teachings to Central Asia and China. From the 7th to 10th century AD, much of Central Asia was converted to Islam. Sadly, in 2001, the great Bamiyan Buddhas were blown up by the Taliban. History unfolded dramatically on this ancient continent. One epic tale gives the Silk Road special meaning. The story of Monk Xuanzang. In the Tang Dynasty, Monk Xuanzang ventured alone through the Dangting Gobi Desert. After much trials and dangers, he finally reached Nalanda Monastery in India. In 645, Monk Xuanzang returned to China with over 600 Buddhist Mahayana and Hinayana scriptures, seven statues of the Buddha, and more than 100 cerebral relics. It was 17 years ago that he left Chang'an, capital of the Tang dynasty. At his return, the whole Chang'an city was enraptured, and Emperor Taizong held a grand ceremony for his homecoming. After this, Buddhism flourished in the Tang Empire and was spread further into Japan and Korea. It was also during the Tang Dynasty that the Silk Road reached its peak. Merchants, monks, scholars, artists, and musicians of all ethnicities flocked to the Great Chang'an and Luoyang, twin capitals of the Great Tang Empire, like a strong heart that piped blood into each and every long route cutting through the deserts or across the seas. The Great Tang Empire stood as the final destination on the Silk Road for many travelers from different countries. To this day, the high Tang culture in terms of arts, literature, music, dance, fashion, moral codes, architecture, Confucianism, and philosophy has greatly influenced other East Asian countries, such as Japan, Korea, Vietnam, and Kyukyu Islands. From the east to the west, there are many desolate areas on the Silk Road, as well as many places of breathtaking ancient heritage. Moving across the Persian Empire, there lies the Arab world. Towards its north lies the cradle of one of the world's oldest civilizations. The Mesopotamian Plain, south of the Fertile Plain, stands the ruins of Babylon, the biblical fallen city. Still further west is the great Alexandria of Egypt, another cradle of ancient civilization. Cutting through the Mediterranean and going north is the great Constantinople, the ancient Byzantine between the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. Remember Yeats's poem, Sailing to the Byzantine. Like Chang'an, this too was the final destination for many travelers at that time. Moving on still further, sailing along the Mediterranean coast, the Silk Road reaches Rome. You know, Han Chinese people had a certain impression of Romans. Roman people were all tall and upright, much like the people in China. Thus, it's called the Great Qin or Da Qin in Chinese. Qin, like Han and Tang, were all used to refer to China. For the Han Chinese, the Roman Empire was just like another China standing at the other end of the world. Only its people were physically bigger. At the other end of the Silk Road, Rome was creating its legend as the builder of Western civilization. Just like teachings of the Buddha were shaping much of the Asiatic continent, teachings of Christ were transmitted in Levant along the Black Sea and have transformed the world for centuries to come. Christianity reached great distance through the efforts of its early apostles, and Christian churches were built in each city along the Silk Roads. In Chang'an in 781, a steel was installed to commemorate the arrival of Christianity in the form of Nestorianism. The steel is entitled, The Brilliant Religion of the Roman Empire Flourish in China. Indeed, Eastern Christianity is named the brilliant religion in the Tang Dynasty. To bring Christianity closer to the Chinese people, Christian saints were called Buddhas, and Persian missionaries incorporated elements of Taoist and Buddhist spirituality into their translation of the teachings of the apostles, which then became the Jesus Sutra. The sutra was preserved in Mogao Caves, southeast of the Buddhist center of Dunhuang, in the fashion the Buddhist scriptures were preserved. The spread of Christianity can be traced all along these 4,000 miles. 
From the western end of Silk Road all the way to Chang'an, the official starting point in the east, the Tang Empire, Indian Empire, Persian Empire, Babylonian Empire, Egyptian Empire, Roman Empire, crowns of human civilization at their prime all stood gloriously along these silk roads. The Venetian Marco Polo is perhaps the most famous Westerner who traveled on Silk Road. He excelled all other travelers with his determination, his writing, and his influence. His journey through Asia lasted 24 years. He reached further than any of his predecessors, beyond Mongolia to China. What did Marco Polo discover on his Silk Road? Through it all, Marco Polo marveled at China's cultural customs, great wealth, and complex social structure. He was impressed with China's paper money, efficient communication system, coal mining, gunpowder, and porcelain, and called Shenandu the greatest palace that ever was. Think about it, it was from the small shining cocoons on the mulberry trees that the legend of silk began, and later, this famous Silk Road. And on the Silk Road, civilizations come and go, but the story of culture and trade exchange never ends. One must say, there is much to learn from the workings of time. Today, a new type of Silk Road is under construction by the Chinese government. What's it like? And why has it become controversial? Find out in my next episode. As Marco Polo put it, I did not write half of what I saw, for I knew I would not be believed. So, let's stop for a tea break. Until next time, peace and tea be with you.